But once upon a time, twin boys were conceived in their mother's womb. And as, as they began to grow, each tiny brain began to take shape. And with the devel development of their brains uh, came feelings, and with feelings, perceptions. Perceptions of their surroundings, perceptions of each other, perceptions of their own lives. They discovered that life was good, and they laughed, and they rejoiced in their hearts. One said to the other, we are so lucky to have conceived and to have uh, this world. The other chimed in, yes, blessed be our mother who gave us life in each other. Each of the twins continued to grow and take shape and they stretched their bodies and they turned as best as they could in their tiny little world and they explored around and they found this life cord, this life cord that gave them life through their mother's blood. They were grateful for this new discovery and they're saying, how, how great is the love of our mother that she shares all that she has with us. Weeks passed into months and, and the advent of each two months, they just they noticed some changes going on in their lives and, and they wanted to know the, what the meaning was of these changes. And well, they decided that it means that they were drawing near to birth. And an, an unsettling chill just crept over the two. They were afraid of birth for they knew that it meant leaving the wonderful world that they had been experiencing. Word up to me, one of them said, I would live here forever. But we must be born, the other one said. It, it has happened to all the others, and it's going to happen to us as well. And, and I believe that there's life after birth. Don't you? Well, how can there be life after birth? Do, do we not shed our life cord at birth? And, and have you ever talked to anyone that has been born? Has anyone ever re-entered the womb after birth and, and told the stories and described what life was like after birth? No! How do you know that we live after birth? And as he spoke, he fell into despair. And as he despaired, he moaned if the purpose of conception and of our growth inside the womb is just to end in birth, then truly our life is meaningless. He clutched his precious life cord to his chest and he said, life is, if life is meaningless, then there's no way that there's a mother. But there is a mother, protested the other. Who else gave us nourishment? Who else created this world for us? We get our nourishment from this cord, and our world has always been here. And if there's a mother, where is she? Have you ever seen her? Does she ever talk to you? No. We invented the mother when we were young because it satisfied a need in us, a need to feel security and to feel happy. That's all, that, that's all that the mother is. So while the one lived in despair, the other one resigned himself to birth and placed his trust in the hands of his mother. Hours turned into days and days turned into weeks. And soon it was time. They both knew that their birth was at hand and they both feared what they did not know. And the moment finally came where they were born and they they cried as they were born into this great light. They coughed out fluid. They, they gasped as they breathed in this very dry air. And, and when they sh were sure that they had been born, they, they opened their eyes, seeing life after birth for the very first time. And what did they see? With the beautiful eyes of their mother as they were being cradled lovingly in her arms. And they knew, right then they knew, that they were finally home. Now I have a question for you. Do you think that these twins were designed to live in the womb forever? Now every mother out there is saying, I sure hope not. I mean, it's not likely, right? I'm guessing by the end of the term, they were in pretty tight little quarters in, in that little world that they were living in. And so is it possible that, that these two little guys were designed for life outside of the womb instead? Where they could actually use those legs for something more than just kicking their mother, their poor mother, right? 
But I would guess it would have been very difficult to convince them that, that, that life was so much better on the other side of that tiny little hole, <laughs> that unknown that they were facing. Perspective is everything, isn't it? If we think that we are designed for this life and this life only, uh, what does it mean for us, for our demeanor, as, as we see ourselves approaching the inevitable end of this life? Because I can guarantee you that if you stay long enough on this planet, uh, life through the hole actually starts looking a little bit better, right? But we still really aren't willing to go there. <laughs> because we happen to call that hole a dirty five-letter word. Death. Death. Why are we so afraid of death? And really, the fear of death causes us to desperately hang on to this life, even though the next life just might be better, right? Even as Christians, we struggle with this. Self-preservation, working as hard as we can to avoid death, this can definitely be our religion of choice. Not just during a pandemic, but, but certainly it doesn't hurt to be in the middle of a pandemic and, and focus on our self-preservation, right? We can all relate to this very well. And this is where Easter comes in. This is why we love Easter. This conversation around the resurrection, this conversation around the hope that there is life after death. Would you turn with me to John chapter 11 this morning? We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at somewhat of an unusual passage for Easter, but definitely one of those really relatable stories that we can all get that we find in the Bible. Did you dive in with me? John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Lazarus must have been a really good friend to Jesus. I mean, all they had to say was, the, the one that you love is sick. And Jesus knew exactly who that was. And not only that, this was the basis of the sister's appeal, his love for him. They knew, I mean, they didn't even have to ask Jesus to come. They knew he would come on the basis of his love. And, and they were confident of this response. In fact, the area where they were asking Jesus to go was an area where the people of, of that area had placed a price on his head. It was actually dangerous for him to go there, to go where Lazarus was. And here we are having this, this risk of this five-letter word, death. So Lazarus' condition had to have been serious, right? Deadly serious. And they certainly believed it was worth the risk, or they wouldn't have ever notified Jesus. They would have known that he would have come. This was a desperate situation, Jesus. You've got to save him. He might even die. We can't have him die. And we can relate to this. When we have a loved one who is sick, I mean really sick, right? We, we become desperate really quickly. Again, we have this incredible fear of death. And death was the concern for Mary and Martha. Humans have always been afraid of death, even way back then. And, and it would have been the same for us, right? But Jesus has this odd response in verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. Notice for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So Jesus tells his disciples that this story about Lazarus, his sickness, uh, was, would not ultimately end in his physical death. This story was not about death. This story is about God's power, God's love that would be shown to Lazarus and his family and for the glory of God and for the glory of his son. But amazingly, Jesus doesn't get right to work. What does he do? He waits for some reason. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. 
So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now this part of the story is very confusing to us, or at least to me. Jesus loved the sisters. He loved Lazarus. So he stayed for two more days before he went to help. Uh, wouldn't it make more sense if the story said Jesus loved him so much that he left immediately? So why do you think John made sure to point out that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Well, it was because it sure didn't look like by his actions that he loved them. Hey, Jesus, your best friend is going to die. Go and help him. Don't just stand there. Go and do something. But instead, he chooses to wait. Doesn't this remind you of Holy Saturday? It, Jesus dies at this perfect time right before a Sabbath so that, so that he wasn't able to have a proper burial. But hadn't Jesus just told his disciples many times um, that he would die? But he wouldn't stay dead. He was going to rise again. So why would Jesus need a proper burial if he was just going to raise from the dead again? I mean, at least if you had the faith that you thought he would do that, right? That's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? This belief in life after death is when it actually happens to you or someone you know. Pastor Nathan did a great job last week helping us to think through this in-between place where faith has a chance to grow or die and it really comes back to this choice that we have to make a response to this in-between place this place where God just doesn't seem to be moving fast enough right uh, in fact it looks like and, and probably feels like God's plan is just too slow in fact it's too late it's over Lazarus is dead Jesus is dead in that story. But as we see over and over again in Scripture, God, God's ways, they're not our ways, are they? And, and as soon as we think we can predict what he's about to do, he surprises us, right? And unlike us, he doesn't seem to be afraid of death at all, right? And so in this story, Jesus waits until Lazarus is dead to go see him. <laughs> Now, why would you need to go see a dead guy, you know, a guy after he's dead? I mean, right? For us, death just seems so final. When you die, it's done. It's over. But for Jesus, eh, Lazarus is just sleeping. Lazarus is just sleeping. Jesus, do you realize that sleeping and death is not the same thing? Isn't Jesus so disrespectful to death? And so why would Jesus wait? I just It's amazing to think about. In fact, this passage tells us that he finally arrives four days too late. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. A little late there, Jesus. So why do he wait? Well, Jesus has already told us why he waits. He waited. Verse 4, the sickness was not going to end in death. no. It is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, you have to know that in the Jewish culture, they believe that the spirit of the deceased person um, stayed around for up to three days past their death. And beyond three days, they believe that there, it was no longer possible to resuscitate someone who had died. So, what would four days, being four days late, do for Jesus? Well, it would give him a very clear stage for an indisputable raising from the dead for God's glory. So four days in the tomb, that's what the story is telling us, right? Is that a coincidence? Is Jesus late? Or is Jesus right on time, just like he always is? Verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Now you can just imagine how overwhelmed 
Martha must have been with the untimely death of her brother, right? And you see in this conversation with Jesus that she's not actually rebuking Jesus here at all. It's, she's actually expressing her faith that, that he has the authority to heal sickness. And much to her regret, Jesus just happened to not make it there in time. If only you had been here, Jesus. And what was the big concern for Martha here? <laughs> just like it would be for us, death. Again, death is so final. Death needs to be avoided at all costs. Once, once he's crossed that tunnel, right, he can't come back. And this really is our biggest fear. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. See what Martha's doing here? She takes Jesus' words about rising again and she interprets them as just simply a, a conventional Jewish expression of comfort. You will see him again in heaven. That's what we would say. Reflecting on their belief that, that the resurrection of the dead would come at the end of the age. And so this sets Jesus up to make this titanic, unbelievably crazy claim about himself. And he says it so nonchalantly. Listen to what he says in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> I mean, I'm not death. I'm life. Death has nothing on me. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever li lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, just a moment earlier, Martha had expressed her belief in Jesus' ability to heal sickness. But here Jesus is not talking about sickness, right? He's not talking about healing sickness. He's, he's claiming the authority that he has over death. No one has ever made that type of claim before. Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you will never have to worry about death again. <laughs> and that really is all we do with death, right? We worry about it. Mary and Martha were worried about death when they sent for Jesus. Have you ever worried about death? Obviously, <laughs> you're human, right? Um, should you worry about death? Or should we more focus our attention on life? Now these verses sound contradictory at, at first glance. The one who believes in me will, will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing me will never die. But they're not contradictory. The key here is to understand that Jesus is referring to two different types of death. First, the one who believes in me will live even though they died. Die here refers to physical death. Jesus doesn't promise that those who believe in him will uh, be prevented from physical death. In fact, it's the norm even for Christians to, to go through physical death, at least until Jesus returns. But because he is the resurrection, he can promise that he will raise us physically from the dead. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the second part here, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Die here is actually talking about spiritual death, eternal separation from God. The Bible teaches that we come into this world eternally separated from God. And we are headed for an eternity eternally separated from Him if something doesn't change. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Now, if this is where you are when you are thinking about death, uh, you probably should be worried about death, right? But because Jesus is the life, that's what he calls himself, he's the source of spiritual, eternal life, those who believe in him immediately receive reconciliation with God. They, they are brought back into a right relationship with God. Praise the Lord. Again. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, when, when you were dead in your sins and the and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all your sins. And, and not only that, he guaranteed uh, deliverance from eternal death. Listen to John chapter 5. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life and will not be judged but is crossed over from death to life. This life is avail available to every one of us regardless of what sins we've gotten ourselves into. But this gift is available only through Jesus Christ. Why only Jesus? Well, it comes back to the Easter story. On Good Friday, Jesus died to pay for our sins. And he was raised to life on Easter to show that he has the power over death. Two things that humans struggle with mightily, <laughs> sin and death, right? Jesus took care of them for us. And because of this work, Jesus, the Son of God, who promises to be with us always, will also be with us on that moment that we are the most afraid of, that moment where we cross over and we experience death. Jesus will be with us. Jesus is the only companion you will ever know that will never leave your side. Never. Ever. <laughs> But there is a condition to this. Do you believe this? This is what Jesus asked Martha, right? Do you trust that Jesus is who he says he is? The good news is only good if you receive it, if you receive him. Read John eleven twenty seven for the correct response to this question. Martha replies, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. Now, the content of Martha's reply is really important. She doesn't just believe that in some abstract sense that there would be this final resurrection. She doesn't just believe that Jesus is some guru, spiritual guru, or, or maybe a guardian angel that would protect. Uh, she believes him to personally be God's unique Messiah and as the Messiah, the Savior of humanity. And Jesus asked you this same question. Do you believe this? According to the Bible, your present relationship with God, if you have not received him, is not looking so hot. Your, your eternal destiny depends on your response to this question. If you have never done so, if you've never received Christ, if you've never believed who he was, would you just take a moment this morning to tell him, tell Jesus that you believe in him, that you believe him in him the same way that Martha does? Now, Martha didn't know everything about what she was saying when she was confessing Jesus as the Messiah, as, as Lord, right? Let's finish the story, and, and let me just fill out the details, and then I'll give you an opportunity later on to with Jesus, and I'll help you with that. Does that work? Now, anyone can, complain, can um, claim that they are the resurrection and the life. In order for Jesus to actually make good in this, he had to prove it. But, but before Jesus performs this sign, he, he does something else, and I want to share this with you because I think it's really important. Verse 28, after Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Now when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, look at what it says here. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see him, Lord, they replied. It says, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Now why did Jesus weep? I mean, think about it. It wasn't because he, he was losing Lazarus. Because he knew in just a moment he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. This wasn't about Lazarus. He wept because 
the people around him were sad. Think about that. He was feeling their very real loss. He was connecting with them. Can you believe that an all-powerful being like Jesus, uh, someone that the Bible actually says had a part in creating the universe, um, that he could actually care about people and feel the same things that they're going through, have compassion and empathy for them, that he actually cares for you, that he actually cares for me. In fact, God created humans as as personal spiritual beings, and they were never designed to die. They're actually designed to live forever. It was sin that brought death into the world. And the tragedy of physical death and the physical separation that we have with our loved ones when they die, it causes Jesus to to feel that same connection with us and, and weep and be sad with us. And as Jesus comes to the tomb in this story, he is just full of passion. He's full of compassion. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Now you have to remember that the Jews did not embalm corpses. corpses. So, so Lazarus' body, if it had been in there for four days, it would have stunk, right? Horrible, horribly. Um, so you can see that Martha didn't quite understand what Jesus was about to do, right? Verse 40, Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then, then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let them go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Isn't it amazing that even after witnessing the power over death, still some did not believe in Jesus? So what do we learn from this story about Lazarus? And and maybe how, how does it inform are what we know about the Easter story. Jesus has the power over death, doesn't he? That's definitely something that we can see in both of the stories. And he also cares very deeply for us, for people. And we can also see in both stories that he is the resurrection and the life. Two things that that make death completely powerless against us if we only believe in him. So are you ready to put your fear of death aside and trust in Jesus instead? That's a difficult thing to do. Many of us, as, even as Christians, we struggle with this fear of death, don't we? But can we choose to trust that Jesus' death wipes away any of the sin and shame that we find in our lives? Restoring our relationship with God? Can we also trust maybe that Jesus will always, always care about us, even when he seems to be too slow or maybe too late to help us in whatever situation we see ourselves in? His plan, whether we can understand it or not, is, is always for the best, isn't it? And can we choose to trust that Jesus is always faithful to his word, that he will always be with us, and that even death can't separate us from the love of God? Where are you this morning? Would you be willing to ask God to help you to face life and death as Jesus does? Would you be willing to receive Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, and maybe most important, as your friend. 
Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, I just want to thank you for loving me with the most unbelievable, incredible love. A love that was willing to die on a cross so that my sins could be forgiven. And that you want me to experience the life that you have designed for me, that you have for me. You love me that much. Even this new life that that comes in you at the end of this scary tunnel called death. Would you please forgive my sins and become my Savior, my Lord, my friend. And now, Lord, I trust you with my life. Would you help me by your Spirit to live into this new life that you called me into? I look forward to the days ahead, Lord, in your company as my friend. And I will give you all the glory in your wonderful name. Amen. Now, if you've asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, the Bible tells us that heaven is celebrating. I mean, think about that. Because of your decision to follow Christ and to follow his ways there's a party going on in heaven in your honor (laughs) isn't that awesome and we would love to celebrate with you as well and and maybe even come alongside of you and help you in the journey as you get started with jesus so would you reach out to us i would encourage you to to use the the technology that's tied to this broadcast or maybe send us an email or give us a call we'd love to hear from you we'd love to celebrate with you And for those who are still a little bit skeptical about this resurrection idea, I get it. I have just encourage you to come back next week and hear some more. We love to share life with you and have some good conversations. And I'd also invite you to consider um, what Chuck Colson has to say about the resurrection. He, He was President Nixon's special counsel during Watergate and really his henchman. And this is what he said about the resurrection. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. The Watergate (laughs) proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that, that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. And they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Unless it's true. As we close the service this morning, hear these words from our benediction passage from Isaiah 41. God, our helper, says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Praise the Lord. People of God, trust in the Lord this week. Be his hands and feet. Celebrate your hope in Christ. You are sent.